Well, this morning's message is, why don't I have a hallmark marriage? Why don't I have a hallmark marriage? And I just want to, I wanted to check the other day about whether everyone knew what a hallmark movie was. When I was in my Who Me class the other day, there were about 35 people asked, who watches hallmark movies? About 30 out of the 35 in my Who Me class watch hallmark movies. So I thought, well, I'm really tapping into something in the community right now. I'm really getting to the heart of the community right now. But I thought I'd just explain to you, a hallmark movie is basically just just like Jurassic World is it is exactly the same first of all you know exactly what's gonna happen <laughs> secondly you feel like it's just like the last movie you know that the acting is probably not going to get an Oscar the ending is entirely predictable I mean in Jurassic World everybody dies don't want to give too much away and finally you enjoy it anyway and you feel good afterwards so uh, anyway so what is a hallmark marriage you know a hallmark relationship seems to be pretty high on romance pretty high on values and one thing I really appreciate about that that brand hallmark is that no one's leaping into bed with each other. It values intimacy. It cherishes a kiss and the kind of kiss that you don't squirm over when, when your kids are watching with you. Relationships matter more than the top executive job. Hallmark movies expect marriage fidelity. Older folks are appreciated and those who have been married a long time are considered wise. Amen to that as well. Now, Hallmark loves the countryside, pickles, pickup trucks, but not pickup lines because they're always afraid to really say what they think. Have you noticed that? And it's not coated with the cynicism that coats so much today. Now, I know it's cheesy and extremely cheesy, which to some is the unforgivable sin, but I'm nonetheless grateful for a positive alternative. And the question is, therefore, why don't I have a hallmark marriage? Why don't we have that? Well, first of all, no one does because the whole romance, the whole movie takes so long to get to it, it literally ends at the wedding. And so we don't see these handsome couples struggle and prevail in marriage because it ends at the wedding day. So in one sense, don't worry, you've got nothing to compare yourself with. A hallmark marriage doesn't actually exist. But if we do need to compare ourselves, we don't need to compare ourselves with one another because that's a dangerous thing and we could easily feel inadequate. But I'll tell you what, we can compare ourselves to the Word of God. The Word of God is a filter for us that shows us how we're supposed to live. So I'm going to ask everyone to turn to a very special story, to Genesis chapter 26. It's a story that's not often told, but it's there in the Scriptures for our benefit and for our blessing on this Valentine's Day. So everyone, would you turn with me to Genesis chapter 26 and verse 1. We're looking at the story of Isaac. Isaac was probably the quietest of all the patriarchs. There's the least said about him, and he doesn't seem to say very much. He may well have been a quiet fellow, but we're going to see that God spoke to him in power here in Genesis 26. And we're going to now look at three things for an enduring and blessed marriage that doesn't compare ourselves to Hallmark, but compares ourselves to the Bible. So here we go, Genesis 26 verse 1. Now there was a famine in the land... Besides the previous famine in Abraham's time, and Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. Let me tell you something. When there's a famine in the Middle East, when there's a people upheaval in the Middle East, that affects everything. It's happening right now before our eyes in this world, and it was happening here in verse 1. But notice that God intervenes in verse 2. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and your descendants, I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. Now we're moving into what we call covenant language, the language of relationship and promise between God and his people. Verse 4, it continues, the Lord says, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed me and did everything I required of him, keeping my commands, my decrees, and my instructions. So Isaac stayed in Gerar. When the men of that place asked him about his wife, he said, She is my sister. 
because he was afraid to say, she's my wife. He thought, hmm, the men of this place might kill me on account of Rebecca because she's beautiful. By the way, his dad, Abraham, did the same thing as well. He was kind of like a chip off the old block, and that was one, Abraham obeyed, but that was probably one thing he didn't need to imitate, right? Verse 8, but this is a, a snapshot I want us to focus on this morning. When Isaac had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked down from a window and saw Isaac caressing his wife, Rebekah. And of course, I did a little word analysis and looked at some of the Hebrew here. And what I noticed here was that the amplified version does not amplify this. It's like the only time the amplified version doesn't add anything, it just left it well alone with Isaac there caressing his wife, Rebecca. It's clear, though, that he's not kissing his sister, but he's with his wife right now. And verse 9, so Abimelech summoned Isaac and said, she's really your wife. Why did you say She's my sister. Isaac answered him, because I thought I might lose my life on account of her. Then Abimelech said, what is this you've done to us? One of the men might well have slept with your wife and you would have brought guilt upon us. This is very important to notice this. Philistine king says this would have brought guilt on us. So Abimelech gave orders to all the people, anyone who harms this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Isaac planted crops in that land and the same year reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. And all God's people said, amen. And Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll give us divine concentration, a listening and a doing of your word. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So I'm gonna ask the question first of all, what is the goal of marriage today? with a marriage taking place next week. What is the ultimate goal of marriage? And I want to say right from the start, it's a fairly well-worn theme that good Christian teachers have been emphasizing really. The goal of marriage is not our happiness, but it's our holiness. It's being in a place where God can use us because if the purpose of the marriage is just for me and my contentment, I'll put so much pressure on that relationship that it will never satisfy. And anyway, one day, we're gonna be parted by death. That's why that's so important to mention that in our wedding vows, until death parts, parts us, one day we will be separated. So if we put all our store in that relationship, if all our life is invested in, in that relationship, and that's our only sense of identity, then one day we're gonna be profoundly in despair. So what is the point of marriage? I'm gonna suggest that the point of marriage is all about walking with God. And that's what we see here in, Isaac, in Isaac's story here from verse 2 to verse 6. It's Isaac's relationship with God that ultimately defines his life. Now, he wasn't perfect. In fact, we even see him making mistakes here in chapter 26. But the whole story of Isaac is that Abraham waited 100 years to have Isaac as a child. And then Isaac is born. And Isaac goes another 40 years before he's even married. He's a child of promise. He has a holy line that's going to lead ultimately to the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, the family in which Jesus will be born. But clearly, this is not about Isaac. This is about God working in the world. The whole hinge of history is here in Genesis 26 with the story of Isaac. And so Isaac knew God, and God spoke to him in verse 2. And because God spoke to him, what did Isaac do, everyone? He obeyed God. God said, I want you to stay in Gerar, in the land of the Philistines. And what did Isaac do? He stayed where God told him to stay. And so if you want to do marriage well, make sure that you know God and you obey God because marriage goes much better when we have God in the center and we're obeying him. If we're in rebellion, if we're doing our own thing, if we're disobeying God, then I'll tell you what, marriage will not go nearly as well. Give me an amen if you know that's true. We need God in our marriage. So the first point I want to make, make this morning is find your identity in the Lord. Find your security in God. 
Because insecure people don't make very good married people. Because if we're insecure and trying to find everything just in our spouse, we will never have enough and we will never be satisfied. And if we're single and thinking, you know, if I could just have that relationship, I would say, God bless you and may that happen. But I tell you what, if you think that your whole identity is going to be wrapped up in that relationship, you will ultimately be disappointed. And that's not to cast any dispersion on the other soul, because the other one in the marriage, if, if your spouse is also secure in Christ, it sort of liberates you and frees you up to be married. Because when you're both surrendered to the living God, when you both find your identity in Christ, when we're both secure in Christ, it makes for a much more secure and blessed marriage. I heard someone say it goes like this sometimes. There is the ideal. Everyone say ideal. It's good to have a high expectation, but then there comes the ordeal. Everyone say ordeal. We get problems, don't we? That there will be problems in your marriage. The question is, how do we handle that? Some people move on to the next phase, which is raw deal. Say raw deal. And that's when we start to feel like, oh, they've not done what I wanted, and things haven't been right, and we feel sorry for ourselves, and we get embittered, and that leads then to the new deal. Say new deal. So we've gone from ideal to ordeal to raw deal to new deal. And that's the way the world sees it because if our security is in the relationship, if the security is in our happiness, if the security is how well we think things are going, then we will be disappointed and we will start to look elsewhere. And that's what society has become like to so many. Serial monogamy. Experiencing this and moving on to the next one and always being disappointed. I feel I'm supposed to speak this word out this morning to the church. That's the word validation. I think every one of us so easily has this sense of, you know, validate me, love me, respect me. You know, give me what I need. And the problem is whenever we seek validation, we will always be disappointed unless we find our security in the Lord. We want people to like us. We want people to appreciate us. And so we end up doing weird things to make people like us or appreciate us or get on board with us. Instead, if we're secure in Christ, it doesn't matter what the world thinks. In fact, the world will even hate us. But when the world does hate us, if our security is in Christ, we will rejoice anyway. We will praise God anyway, because our security, our identity will not be affected by whether or not the world hates us or likes us or loves us, amen? So brother and sister, find your security in Christ today. In fact, if we think of nothing else today, I would say that's a good thing. I'm gonna be secure in Christ. I'm gonna trust God. I think that will make me a better husband. I think that will make me a better father and grandfather and pastor if I'm putting my security, first of all, in God, in Christ Jesus. Now, Isaac was actually quite mature at this point. In fact, some experts that did quite a bit of research on this say he was somewhere between the age of 60 and even 100. So here's a man relatively later in life hearing from God, and God says, stay here. So Isaac stays there because his identity is in Christ. His identity is in God himself. So you and I would start marriage well if we determine there's a divine purpose in my life. I'm going to discover what that person is. I'm going to obey it. I'm going to receive divine help. And I will go through suffering. And I will go through trials. And things will go wrong in my marriage. And things will go wrong with my children and grandchildren. And in my community and nation, there will be tough times. And in this fast-changing world, we will sometimes feel insecure. But if our security is not even in our nationhood, not even in our family, not in our relationship, but if our security is in God, then we stand secure. We stand strong. And we don't need to go up and down and up and down if our security is in Christ. Can I have an amen on that one there? And there's one other word I want to say on this, and that is uh, verse 12. Notice that the story moves on. And Isaac plants crops in the land. And in the same year reaped how many? A hundredfold. Because why, everyone? Why? Because the Lord blessed him. And may I say today, let your life be good soil that receives the seed of the kingdom of God. Let your life be good soil today that receives the forgiveness that there is in Christ, a right relationship with Christ. No matter what you've done or where you've been, we can all be right with him today. In fact, if we've been kind of been a good church person all these years, but right now our heart is hardened and we're not tender to God, we're in a perilous position. 
But if we've been far from God and we've come here today, we're broken, we feel unworthy, and we need forgiveness. You know, Jesus said that attitude is much closer to the attitude that says, I don't need mercy. I don't need your help. But let me tell you, if we can come to God and ask for mercy today, he will forgive us. He will wash us clean. You're only a prayer away from a fresh resurrection taking place in your life today. So find your identity in Lord. Secondly, in the story of Isaac we see here, be faithful to your marriage. And that's the whole backcloth to this story here, that the marriage of Isaac is under threat. And I want to say, my friend, so is yours. Every marriage here is under threat because I know that I know that I know that the devil is trying to separate you and your spouse. The devil is trying to ruin intimacy, break that marriage because marriage is God's chosen picture of his relationship between himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the, ch the church. This is God's divine picture. So therefore, the spiritual battle is especially centered on let's mess up Christian marriages. Let's mess up the church because then it'll be much harder for people to see the living God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So our marriage is under threat. And the back cloth here is that Isaac, the son of promise, the man of the covenant, Isaac is now living in the land of the Philistines. And we know that word, the Philistines, to us is like a byword, not only for lack of culture and being uncultured, but of being pagan and heathen and not part of God's family. And God says to Isaac, I want you to live in the land of the Philistines. I'm gonna say something that will, you will agree with, I believe, but I think it will shock you as well, that we're living in the land of the Philistines. We're living in a land that is not rightly related to the God, but I thank God for so many who have not bowed the knee. I thank God for so many who are following the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God for amazing things that God is doing. But you may say, Pastor, how can you say that so quickly that we're living in the land of the Philistines? Let me explain. You know this whole thing about Isaac getting afraid that they might kill his wife because she's beautiful, and so he says, well, she's my sister, then we turns out people discover that he really was married to her. What's the whole backstory there? The backstory is this, that marriage is precious. Marriage is precious. And here's the crazy thing. This is crazy. Even the Philistines know it. King Abimelech, head of the Philistines, he knows it as well, that if the marriage bond is violated or broken, then guilt will come upon the whole land. You, I, I want us to really get this. So, so the Philistines, they're like one of the worst names we can think of in the Bible. Even they knew that if the marriage bond was violated through adultery, then guilt would come upon the whole land. And in America, last year, the so-called Supreme Court decided they can do away with a biblical understanding of marriage. And you know the story, the death of Supreme Court Judge Scalia died yesterday has caused a huge reaction, and that's going to be a massive backcloth to the election, of course, that happens later in the, uh, this year. We should pray for his replacement. We should, of course, honor his life and try and grab hold of his story and see what things can be celebrated. It sounds like a pretty good thing to have to have died with 28 grandchildren. That's quite a legacy, isn't it? Incredible legacy, and we should pray about this. But I wanna say it again, even the Philistines, a byword for uncultured heathenism, knew better than even so many in our nation know as well. And that ought to cause us to tremble because the Philistines knew that if we violate marriage, judgment comes upon the land. Even the Phil do you get that? Even the Philistines got that. And I think that should wake us up and go, God have mercy upon our nation. Lord, we come before you. How can we live a half-hearted Christian life when God's chosen way of expressing what the relationship between Christ and his people is, when that is being messed with, a land is in danger. In one sense, you could argue that we're worse than the Philistines right now. And I just say, God, have mercy on us. But you know what? I say that with hope. Have mercy on us, Lord, because maybe we will turn our hearts to him. We will repent. We will become more like him. And revival will flow, and this nation will be changed again. If you agree with me, would you give God praise? Amen. 
And so Isaac and Rebecca's marriage was not only generally under threat, it was specifically under threat, but I thank God that they were faithful to each other and no one else violated their marriage bond. What a blessing that is. And if you've been through that situation, if you could say, well, we've been faithful to each other, just give thanks because you know it's only by his grace and only by his, at times, divine intervention that that was possible. We would, uh, count, I would counsel young people, if you're constructing wedding vows in the future, I would say, come up with wedding vows that especially, especially define the covenant. Make sure it really defines the covenant. I don't think it's so much the need for a romance thing, but it really is about define what the covenant is and say this is what we will be faithful to. Now, what is faithfulness? Yes, of course, it means that we are exclusive, that it's just us. Faithfulness means, in one sense, not being with someone else. But faithfulness is more than that. It's actually about being faithful to each other by giving up of ourselves to each other 100% and not holding back. You know, if marriage is just a priority in your life, so you've got, uh, obviously God, we agree God should be the top, amen? God, God should be top. But if it's like, okay, activities, sports, work, paying the bills, and all this other stuff, and if marriage kind of comes right down there, can I just tell you something? You haven't got a chance. If marriage is not right up there in your priorities, you will not succeed. Almost certainly, you will find yourself in a relationship, and you may technically have remained faithful to each other, but you're not really being faithful to each other, because the husband is supposed to say, according to Ephesians 5, I'm going to sacrifice my life for you. And the wife is supposed to say, I'm going to respect you and submit to your authority. And so the leader is a sacrificial leader who lives like Jesus, and the wife responds to that leadership. It's a beautiful picture. But I tell you what, you can't do that with marriage as like your fifth or sixth priority. It needs to be right up there. For us, we always say, Louise even used to write GMF. She used to stick it around our house in the early days of marriage. It just said, God, marriage, family. All over our house, it said GMF. God, marriage, family family, and everything else follows from that. Obviously, the church of Jesus Christ is a high priority. We need each other. We need to support one another. You know, the Pharisees, I heard someone say this, the Pharisees said, let's go to Deuteronomy and talk about divorce. But Jesus said, let's go to Genesis and talk about marriage. I encourage you to be faithful. Faithful means constantly putting one another first in our marriage. Find your identity in the Lord and be faithful in your marriage. That's a great foundation. But there's one more thing I want us to learn from this lovely picture in verse 8, and that is practice intimacy. Intimacy needs to be practiced. So let's look look again at verse 8. When Isaac had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked down from a window and saw Isaac caressing his wife, Rebecca. Now, are we allowed to, to say that in church? Are we allowed to use that word, caress, in church? Absolutely. It's in the Bible. Say to someone right now, it's in the Bible. That's all you have to say for right now. This couple have been married for quite a while, and so if they were aged somewhere between 60 and 100, that means that this was quite a mature couple. Think about that. Here's a mature couple caressing each other, Okay? And maybe there's some young folks and you just want to go, ew. How do you say that, by the way? How do you say that? Go on, let me hear it, let me hear it young folks. Ew, that's how you say it. Okay. Okay, you might say ew. Because, you know, on TV, the, the, the notion is if to, be, to be cool, to be in love, to, to be active, you've got to be young and not married. Because it's way more romantic, right, to be not married and young. So if ever a couple are in bed and they're married on the TV, they've either got the flu or the children have been awake all night. Have you noticed that? (laughs) And so there's this image of of parents, it's like we get a pretty bad rap. But all marriages need intimacy and, and we need to think about that and talk about that and encourage marriages to remain intimate. Now there may come a time through physical health, through through very old age, where there are physical issues that make that less possible, and, and there, there needs to be great empathy and, and sympathy during that time to one another, great love and tenderness to each other, but essentially, to be faithful and to be intimate really means exactly that, until death parts. 
And so I, I texted Hugh and Mary Lynn. I thought, I need to talk to some experts here on this one here. And we love you guys. And so you guys prayed about that. And Mary Lynn got woken in the night. The Lord gave her a word. So I want you to write down what God told Mary Lynn in the middle of the night about how we can increase intimacy in our relationships. Thanks, sister. And this is what she came with. It's, it's very easy to remember, isn't it? F-A-T. Okay, F-A-T. I've got it in my notes somewhere, Mary Lynn. I've forgotten what it is already. Here we go. F-A-T. Frequent, affectionate touch. That's pretty good, isn't it? Say that with me, everyone. Frequent, affectionate touch. So that touch needs to be frequent. It needs to be affectionate. And it needs to be touch as well. So we want to dispel the myth that only really young people know how to do that. Actually, if you've been married for any length of time, you know that when you were young, you didn't know anything. Some of the brothers are going like, the older brothers are going, yeah. <laughs> I, got, I had the same reaction at the South Campus as well. Actually, it's one of those things that improves with age. As you, amen, brother there. Another marriage expert, marriage counselor here as well. And, uh, and you say, well, well, what if it's not? Well, well, frequent, affectionate touch. The experts say actually is a really good place to begin. Just work on that side of things. And all other rivals, all other fantasies. I, by the way, Hallmark movies are fine, but I tell you what, watch out for those fantasy novels romantically that, that, that encourage you to think about this fantasy that doesn't really exist, that can take you away from your true love and your true one. But practice frequent affectionate touch. Now, I know that there's a few Downton Abbey fans out there. Actually, there's 10 million in America. Yeah, Jalen, give, give us a wave, some of the Downton Abbey fans. And I know that you are crazy for it as well, like kind of totally into it. And one of the favorite, most endearing characters are Mr. Carson and Mrs. Hughes, who, uh, who get married. It's a wonderful story. Mr. Carson is the butler, and Mrs. Hughes is the Scottish spinster. And uh, you probably followed the story, some of you who knew about this. And, and as it comes to the, the time of them getting married, they're probably both really old, like 60. <laughs> I'm guessing they're, at that, they're in that kind of age range. Well, in this sort of very Edwardian politeness, Mrs. Hughes, she wasn't feeling so good about herself. She's a little older, and she's thinking, will he really want me? And so via an intermediary, the helpful Mrs. Patmore, a conversation takes place like, what kind of a marriage will it be? Like when you're really, really old, like 60. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Anyway, <clears throat> and anyway, it comes down to it, and Mr. Carson tells Mrs. Patmore to tell Mrs. Hughes he says, um, I think she's beautiful, and I would like, if she would also like it, a full marriage, a marriage that is a marriage in every sense of the word. Isn't that pretty cool? And if you're Mrs. Hughes, wouldn't you want to hear that as well? And I think that there's a lot of people in our church today who really, in your heart of hearts, no matter what situation you've got to in the marriage, wouldn't you say that's a pretty biblical view to say we need a full marriage in every sense of the word, which does mean frequently, affect, frequent affectionate touch, which means something like Isaac and Rebecca, where even though it was a difficult situation for security, you still couldn't keep your hands off each other, even though those Philistines are watching, and I'm sure it's much easier when there's no one with, within 100 yards of you. But you know, sometimes a couple just has to find time to be with each other. You might, might want to write this down. Rebecca allowed him close. Secondly, Rebecca joined in. By the way, that's good advice. You have to join in. And thirdly, <laughs> it helps. Amen. Thanks, Brother Mel. Expert counseling advice is coming through right now over the radio waves. And thirdly, others could tell that this was a relationship that was more than brother and sister. This was a relationship that had not dried up, but was still fresh and alive. And so how do we do that? Frankly, you have the research tools available to you now as much as I have. How do we do that? I think we have to know ourselves. We need to know our spouse. 
We can sometimes learn from others. We have to be very careful to which source we listen to. I would encourage you, listen to wise people. And you can text Hugh and Mary Lynn, and Mary Lynn's got loads of those gems that wake her up in the night, and she'll give you some great counsel along the way as well. But yes, we can learn from each other. We can observe each other how we do that. They had to snatch time together. And I'll tell you what, generally speaking, if your spouse does something spontaneous, I mean, not if it's illegal, but if they do something spontaneous, try try and run with that. Try and honor them. Because, you know, when you you make, when when you try and express love to the other, you make yourself vulnerable. And so don't reject that. Accept that the loving and, and, and gracious attempt for your spouse to connect with you in that way. And by the way, if you miss, please don't misunderstood, misunderstand anything I'm saying today. We're talking about dignity. We're talking with dignity and with, with um, the word of God here today. But don't you agree with me that being faithful is not just not being faithful. Being faithful is pouring your life into your spouse, prioritizing them. And so on this Valentine's Day, the greatest gift that a husband can give to his wife or wife can give to her husband is to honor each other and just to, to put the marriage much higher up in the priorities. Maybe even turn some of those priorities around. If the activities are killing the marriage, then what has to go? The marriage or the activities? Everyone say activities. That would be the right answer. Yeah. Don't we love our activities in America? Don't we? In Fayette County, isn't it all about the activities? Let's get our priorities right. Maybe there have been misplaced priorities and we've crowded out our loved one from the marriage. It's an opportunity for us today to say, God, I repent. I'm going to seek your face. I'm going to do what's right. I pray that our hearts will be good soil today, that we will find our identity in the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that our hearts will be good soil and that we will be a church that lifts up marriage. I pray that our nation will be good soil as we pray for a new Supreme Court judge. We pray that there will be someone who will uphold the Constitution, believe in the sanctity of marriage and uphold the right to life of a little girl or a little boy in a mother's womb. You talk about women's rights, what about the rights of that little one? a little one that can't answer for themselves, that feels pain, that is a real human being, that is just high on God's priority list, I would say. Yeah. So we're going to pray. Pray for good soil. It seems impossible. We're so divided right now, but God can break through when he breaks the heart of his people. And, And may our hearts be good soil in our relationship for each other.